Technical team, can I have the support to Prabhat's? Can you give Prabhat the hosting at this place? Okay. So, sorry for that. Uh, uh, my technical stuff. Uh, so we were on uh, talking about the managing data in the cloud. So <clears throat> as I said earlier, the cloud infrastructure provides you various options in managing your data storage. So just like on your uh, on a uh, on premise server, it has a concept of a block storage that you can access just like a local storage so it can be SSD based or hard disk based depending on the speed of access uh, you can select uh, which option to uh, go for uh, and also you have to keep in mind uh, that uh, unlike in the uh, on-premise data center uh, your block storage is not really persistent uh, continuously for example if you uh, destroy a compute node uh, your storage goes with it. So you have to keep that in mind when using the block storage. Uh, and shared file systems are, are another layer of storage. So if I take an example of uh, AWS based cloud uh, environment, uh, Amazon EFS is an example of uh, shared file uh, storage mechanism available on the cloud. And uh, in addition to that, there are concepts like uh, block storage. So Amazon S3 is an example of uh, 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 object storage uh, uh, available on the cloud. And it, it's slightly different to block storage and uh, shared file storage. Where uh, when it comes to an object storage, you have to uh, go through an API uh, to access uh, that storage. So then you have to keep in mind uh, those uh, differences uh, when deciding where exactly you want to keep your data. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I mean, these typically these uh, storage options are infinite, infinitely lasting. Uh, for example, both uh, uh, if you take the example of uh, uh, AWS based uh, infrastructure, both uh, EFS and S3 is uh, infinitely uh, uh, scalable. So you can uh, uh, provision S3 based storage and not worry about running out on its page ever. So that's that's one important uh, factor or, or benefit uh, you get uh, uh, by moving into a cloud-based infrastructure. And also, uh, in addition to that type of uh, basic uh, storage capabilities, you also get uh, many other uh, storage options like different databases, uh, data warehouses uh, as, as a service. So you can, uh, depending on the type of uh, data access uh, and, and storage uh, capabilities you want, you can decide to uh, choose one of those services uh, as part of uh, part of your solution. And because you have uh, that type of uh, vast array of storage options, uh, data virtualization is an important uh, factor when you implement the cloud-based solution. That is, uh, uh, since you have your data in multiple different tiers, uh, providing a, a standard virtual uh, data layer so that the the user can see a differentiation between the, the different uh, storage, underlying storage mechanism is very important for your application. So otherwise, it will complicate the data access and your data processing. And also, uh, data retention and housekeeping is very important because all the, the resources you provision on a cloud-based infrastructure would cost you money. So you have to make sure that you set a proper data retention policy. Whenever you don't I mean, have data that you no longer need, you have to make sure that those are removed. Otherwise, you have to end up paying uh, for data that you no longer need. Now, so uh, you, you have to make sure that you have uh, uh, data uh, moving uh, or data uh, implemented where you move your data from one tier to other. Probably you should uh, look at uh, using uh, intelligent tiering where uh, that requirement is taken care of by the, the cloud uh, infrastructure itself, depending on, on uh, 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 the, how old well your data is. So there are, those are the different uh, aspects you have to consider 
uh, when managing uh, data on the cloud and also uh, selecting different uh, storage options uh, when implementing cloud-based solutions. Um, and in addition to uh, uh, storage, uh, that type of uh, persistent storage, uh, use of uh, memory uh, distributed caching is also a, a very important uh, capability or feature that you should consider using in your application uh, because it can give a real boost uh, to, to your application. Uh, why so? Because, I mean, uh, as I said earlier, accessing data itself can cost you money uh, when, you, when you go to different databases and different uh, storage mechanisms. So whenever you have uh, data or what data that you access always, it might be beneficial for you to keep them in, a, in, a, in that data in the memory cache. Or, and also, I mean, in terms of implementing a high performance uh, solution, you would like to have uh, your data access times as small as possible. In, in which case, uh, uh, having a uh, uh, memory caching capability uh, would be handy. And also, in terms of high availability, you, would, you would want to keep uh, uh, things like uh, uh, session data or critical uh, dynamic uh, data elements on a distributed cache so that if the uh, application module fails, uh, you can access that data uh, quickly on another node so that you provide the high availability uh, on your cloud based application. So there are various options uh, available on the, on the cloud based on different technologies. So, I mean, you have already shown in cache these days, uh, uh, memory cache options available on different cloud vendors. Uh, and, and also, when you're using that type of uh, caching capability, uh, it's also important to look at the uh, replication across zones and regions. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, high availability is an important uh, factor in implementing a solution. And, uh, your data plays a critical role in that. You have to make sure when you, whenever you keep data in caches, that you keep multiple copies of them, so that whenever there is a failure in one of your uh, caching nodes, uh, you don't lose uh, that data. Um, okay, so now moving on to another important uh, topic uh, when implementing cloud-based solution. That is infrastructure provision. Now, unlike uh, in an on-premise uh, data center, we are uh, all your infrastructure is there, it's not going to go anywhere, but in a cloud-based infrastructure, it's all virtual. Uh, whenever you want to uh, provision a system, you have to start by provisioning your hardware. So a key uh, factor is that you have to automate that process. And that process has to be a deterministic and a repeatable process where you could you could provision a system identical every time you want to uh, uh, do that uh, take that process uh, uh, whenever you want to do upgrade or whatever so there uh, uh, infrastructure as port is, is a critical uh, uh, implementation that you always have to have uh, that is rather than provisioning uh, infrastructure manually we have to automate that process through what we call infrastructure as code, where you write a set of scripts, where you automate that process. So there are a lot of lot of uh, tools av available for that. Uh, Terraform is, is a very uh, I mean, uh, uh, popular tool. And also to take, for example, uh, AWS uh, based uh, platform, uh, CloudFormation is also a popular infrastructure provision tool. There are, I think in my slide, there is a uh, a script, I mean, this is a very simple script that uh, uh, provide a template for you to provision and to understand. So likewise, uh, the, the, the provisioning capability that comes with infrastructure as code, uh, a lot of those tools allows you to provision a vast array of uh, services that you have to use uh, as part of your uh, uh, cloud uh, implementation. And also, I mean, it supports the uh, important features like uh, blue green deployment, where uh, you want to, while your current system is running, you want to quickly provision another copy of your system. And once you are happy with your new system, you can quickly uh, do a change and destroy the infrastructure uh, uh, resources 
of your older version. So infrastructure as code would help you do that automatically. And uh, another important uh, concept uh, that you, you should always uh, uh, look to use is containerization when it comes to uh, cloud-based infrastructure. So containerization allows you a very powerful way of uh, deploying and managing uh, your workloads and application uh, capabilities on the cloud. So what it does is once you have developed your application, it allows you to make an image of your application and at runtime move it into a runtime container and use uh, something like a container orchestration framework like Kubernetes to manage and run them. And once you containerize your application, it allows you to run your application with the same type of uh, operation and management uh, tooling on any of infrastructure, any cloud provider. So that's a very important uh, uh, factor uh, to consider when when uh, using or implementing cloud-based uh, uh, cloud uh, solution. So uh, as, as part of the, the containerization, it, what it does is Docker, for example, Docker is a, is a very popular uh, container uh, runtime. It, 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 what it does is on top of the, uh, the, the operating, operating system, on top of your infrastructure, it allows you to run your container images in a seamless fashion. So it, it allows you uh, and you need to uh, manage a uh, framework in terms of managing and deployment and deploying your application. So there, again, there are important decisions to make in terms of what type of tech stack you're going to choose in terms of one, one is uh, what type of base Docker image that you are going to select or contain image. So there are multiple image types like uh, Alpine Linux, Ubuntu, or Red Hat uh, 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 base image. So for example, Alpine is a very minimalistic uh, uh, image that you can use for running very simple Java workflow. Uh, but for example, running something complex, uh, you might need something like Ubuntu or Red Hat. So based on your the type of application you uh, want to run, uh, you have to go and see what type of APIs and libraries are available in that in a given uh, container image. And based on that, make the selection. And also uh, a very important uh, factor to also look at, mention to look into is what type of container orchestration framework you are going to use. So Kubernetes is, 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 is the most uh, uh, popular uh, framework, but on top of that, we have uh, flavors like Anthos uh, and also uh, Red Hat OpenShift that has additional features uh, uh, built and also th those are multi-cloud offering. Uh, once you develop uh, your application uh, to work with the uh, container orchestration framework like Anthos, you can, that, that framework is available in any of the cloud, in most of the famous cloud. So once you do that, your application is truly multi-cloud. You can run it anywhere easily. So, so that is one important factor uh, uh, to consider uh, uh, when implementing cloud-based solutions. So I think containerization uh, deserve uh, 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 look at uh, further. I think there's a subsequent uh, uh, webinar I think coming up uh, in the next month. You can you can you can uh, log into that to have a further uh, understanding of uh, the, the the concept of containerization. And I think we, we I think we come halfway yes. through our uh, session. I would exactly. like to hand back to Iran here. Uh, so we have um, some few more messages exactly. before we continue on. Thank you, thank you so much, Prabhat. Um, so I need to tell you, we, we are going to be continuing this very interesting conversation, but let's quickly get into a couple of sponsor videos that we need to display, and we'll get back into the session straight away. Stay tuned.
LSEC Technology solution provider to financial market institutions around the globe. We provide trading, surveillance, clearing, depository solutions to over 25 institutions spread out over five continents. Innovation is the legacy and the foundation of our success and will continue to be a key success factor in our future as well. We are a niche, high-performing organization with world-class talent. We attract the cream of the system in the country. LSEG Technology Products win in the market due to its technical competitiveness. That is, we are a few years ahead of the competition in terms of technology. In, to preserve our competitive advantage, we do invest in keeping our developers abreast and up to date of all the current technologies so that in turn our products are extremely competitive in the marketplace. We belong to a fabulous legacy which has changed year on year to be completely new, current and different. So all of us who is in this organization now and somebody who is a potential family member has an opportunity to shape, navigate, envision what it ought to be for the next centuries to come. We have operated this company in Palambo for the last 15 years. We started in 2007, a staff of four people supporting one core product and we've now grown to 85 people supporting 15 plus products using various different modern technologies. We develop software for export only. This has given us an opportunity to bring in a steady flow of dollars into the country every month. We believe in giving university students an opportunity to work on real world projects. As a result, we have built a very robust internship program. We have successfully implemented several CSR projects over the years, particularly focused on gender diversity. We have a very relaxed global one office culture. We have standard HR policies across the board. We believe that respect must be shown to all fellow employees, regardless of geographic location. We believe that face-to-face -face interactions are very important in building business relationships. As a result, we regularly promote two-way travel programs and make it available for all of our staff on a regular basis. Welcome back, everyone. So this is a reminder to stay tuned till the end of the uh, session to participate in the quiz and be a winner. Um, I'm also thanking the patent sponsors, London Stock Exchange, and Vital Health Innovations Lab. Back to you, Prabhat. Thank you, Aaron. Let me share my screen again. Okay. Um, so I would uh, start off by uh, looking at uh, one important uh, capability that we have to consider when uh, designing applications for the cloud. Uh, that is to support horizontal scalability and the vertical scalability. So scalability is one of the most important aspects of, of feature provided by cloud-based cloud uh, infrastructure that is not typically available uh, in an automated data center. So uh, what is horizontal scalability? Hor horizontal scalability is where you can scale your application horizontally across multiple nodes when your workload uh, requirements go up. So you can do that by monitoring the CPU usage, your memory usage, or whatever other parameters on your uh, application. And when it goes beyond a certain value, you can uh, deploy, dynamically deploy uh, uh, additional infrastructure to scale out your application. So there are multiple frameworks uh, and capabilities available in the cloud that lets you do it. But here I have used an example of uh, using a uh, the container orchestration framework to do that. Uh, and, and also, in addition to uh, uh, horizontal scalability, vertical scalability is also a, a, a feature that you can use uh, when uh, designing applications for the cloud. That is where even within your uh, application node or process node, if you hit a bottleneck, let's say, of for CPU power and memory, provided there's additional uh, capacity available uh, within the node, you can increase uh, them uh, uh, by issuing the required commands within, within the orchestration framework. So that's 
uh, that is an important factor uh, to consider so that you built in the required uh, monitoring of those parameters and uh, uh, required configuration to use the scaling capability. And the next topic is, is, is a, a, a very interesting topic, how we design applications uh, to manage failures. When it comes to cloud compared to a probably on-premise data center, one important factor is that we have to expect there will be more failure. There are so many things that can go wrong on a, in a cloud-based environment. The application can fail. Uh, you may be using multiple cloud-based services. Those services may fail. Uh, your uh, underlying hardware may fail. Even entire cloud uh, region can fail. So you have to make sure when you are designing and implementing your application, you, you implement those ap the applications so that they can tolerate failure. So, so assuming there will be failures is very important so that you implement your application in a load balanced or sharded manner. So you don't implement your application to be monolithic, uh, run doing everything in a single node. So you make sure your application can sustain failure. And also one other important uh, facet is that you should be able to restart uh, your application very quickly, provided uh, a, a node fail within the cloud environment can quickly spin up another uh, compute node. After doing that, you should be able to quickly restart your application. So loading up a state, probably from a memory cache or a database is an important factor to consider when, when designing your application. And also you can use high availability features available on the cloud itself. For most of the cloud services, uh, they are available in multi-zone uh, uh, mode so that uh, rather than using a single zone mode where uh, if there is a failure the service will be unavailable you can use us use services uh, that are uh, multi-zone capable and also uh, you have to consider things like uh, replicating data across data centers if required so that's my uh, uh, next uh, point uh, that that something else that we want to discuss about uh, how do you recover from application failure so one, one important uh, consideration is that uh, you have to uh, consider implementing stateless applications. That is, you don't keep application state within the application memory itself. So, I mean, if you do that, when, when a node fails, your application state also goes and there is no way of recovering that. So implementing a stateless application is very important. You may keep your state in the database if, if it doesn't require high performance, you can keep the state uh, in a distributed uh, in memory cache if performance is a con consideration. And also going serverless is also uh, another uh, uh, capability that you can use. So serverless uh, architecture, uh, for example, uh, what is offered uh, within AWS is a, a, a Lambda-based serverless uh, architecture. You can consider using a serverless architecture which, which is inherently uh, 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 supporting uh, uh, failure recovery. And also in terms of uh, managing your data, you have to make sure that you always keep multiple copies of your data so that failure of a single component or a underlying uh, data persistence capability is not going to impact your application. Uh, and also uh, uh, consider distributing your application on multiple zones and regions. So that is a concept uh, provided by most of the, the cloud vendors. So consider using those capabilities. And also uh, in terms of uh, uh, supporting uh, infrastructure failure, I and mean, a lot of uh, uh, cloud vendors provide the, the concept of uh, uh, recovering from uh, node failure and also your uh, 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 Contain orchestration framework also allows you to uh, recover from uh, node failures where uh, depending on a failed node, uh, you can quickly spin up a new node. And as I said earlier, you can restart your uh, application uh, on, on one of the, the, the nodes that you spin up after failure of a, a given node. And in terms of business continuity, as I said earlier, you have to consider whether you need to run your 
application on multiple regions. So that depends on how critical the application is. Uh, if it is a mission critical application, obviously you would need to uh, uh, consider multi-region implementation, but the, the catch is that it will increase your cost. So unless there is a uh, valid reason uh, to implement a multi-region uh, application, uh, you, should, you should consider just implementing your application is in multiple availability zones without trying to implement it uh, across a different region. But if it is a really mission critical application, probably you need to incur that additional cost and uh, go to go for a multi-region implementation. Maybe uh, a region failure is a event that might only occur once in few years, but if it is, I mean, if your application is mission critical, you have to, uh, uh, cover that uh, rare uh, occurrence as part of your design. Uh, and also uh, uh, you have to consider things like regulatory comments. For example, uh, we are in the business of implementing uh, 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 financial markets where regulators would tell that you can't have an outage and they would determine, uh, indicate that this is the uptime you have to have your, uh, for your, uh, uh, system infrastructure and that and because of that it, it may be mandatory uh, for you to implement a, a disaster recovery uh, capability that includes a, a secondary region and also as part of the uh, implementing a second region there can be a different strategy I mean it can be just an offline uh, region where you just uh, replicate your data or it can be a warm standby where the application is started but it doesn't do any processing. You, you replicate the data in case your, your site fails. At that point, you just start up your secondary region. Or in, in most of the most, uh, uh, if it is really mission critical application, you might have to consider running the application active active on, on both regions. Where if, if there's a region failure, immediately you can. Uh, 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 payload to a second region. So it all depends on your, uh, what we call RTU and RTO, that is recovery time objective and the recovery point objective. It all depends on how long you can wait uh, till your payload to your secondary site and also how much data you can lose in the event of there is a site payload. So, so those are con considerations you have to uh, look at when implementing that kind of uh, uh, second region implementation. And also, uh, uh, replicating application state and data onto your second region is important. For example, in most of the, the database uh, services offered on the cloud uh, natively support that kind of replication uh, and also in, in uh, a kind of storage uh, mechanisms uh, that, is, that are available on the cloud. It supports uh, uh, replication to a different region. So wherever it's natively available, uh, from your cloud, cloud provider, it's easier to use those uh, services rather than trying to apply or implement those at the application level. And monitoring the application is also also very important. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, on the cloud uh, environment, it's it's uh, really uh, unlike on 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 premise data center where we have access to all the resources. Cloud on a cloud environment, you have to have very good monitoring tools uh, to make sure that you have visibility to everything that goes in, in your in your infrastructure. So you can monitor the health of your uh, cloud resources. You can monitor the, the statistics, uh, application statistics, and uh, determine what is going on. Uh, security is also a consideration. You have to make sure that you monitor everything so that uh, when, whenever there is suspicious activity, uh, uh, you can figure out what, what is going on. So there are so many tools available uh, in the market, depending on how critical uh, your application is. Again, uh, you have to select the correct tool for the monitoring uh, uh, of the application. And also uh, security, uh, I just, uh, just touched that point, is very important on the cloud. Why? Unlike on a, uh, on a on premise data center where you manage yourself, uh, cloud is public infrastructure so that you can't take any assumptions uh, in terms of uh, uh, what type of uh, threat are, are they are on, on that infrastructure. So uh, we have a concept of uh, zero trust uh, when it comes to cloud. That means you cannot trust even within your own 
a private uh, network that is defined within the cloud because it, it is underlying uh, uh, infrastructure is public. Uh, so because of all those uh, reasons, uh, you have to have uh, very granular policies to manage access authentication. And also you have to have uh, uh, a very uh, strong uh, and, and uh, uh, tools that, that has the required functionality to do, to do all those monitoring and alerting whenever required. Um, and also, uh, I would like to touch upon uh, in my last two slides, two important uh, points. Uh, one is the concept of cloud agnostic uh, system. Now, when implementing uh, cloud-based solutions, it's very easy to use uh, uh, cloud-specific capabilities provided by, for example, AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud, or whatever, because it, it allows you to quickly implement a solution. But if you do that, you get locked down to that cloud provider. Uh, and if you, for, for, for some reason, if you want to move from that infrastructure to a different cloud vendor, then you are stuck. Because of that, it's very important uh, to make sure, at least to, to a certain extent, to make, make your solutions cloud agnostic. Uh, and to achieve that, containerization is, is a very good strategy. There are, uh, you use a containerization and a container orchestration framework that is multi-cloud capable, which allows you to easily move between different cloud vendors. So uh, implementing uh, systems that are cloud agnostic is very important. Uh, and also uh, as my uh, uh, last slide, I would like to touch upon two important concepts uh, that is hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud is where you have, you combine your on-premise data center with a cloud provider. So that is that is very essential where when you have existing systems, probably a legacy system that are that is very difficult to move to cloud. In that instance, you might have to keep those in, in your own data center, but move the rest of your uh, applications onto the cloud, but combine the two together so that you provide a hybrid uh, infrastructure where some of the applications run on-premise and some of the applications run in a cloud-based environment. And also uh, coupled with the, the cloud agnostic uh, type of implementation, a multi-cloud uh, concept is also important. Multi-cloud concept is where you implement a system, uh, where you use uh, different cloud vendors for different segments of the application. So that you might do that because uh, some of the, the critical requirements or features are available on, on only from a, a specific cloud vendor. So, so in that case, a kind of scenario, you would implement your system on, on a multi-cloud environment. But as, as a suggestion, I would say as much as possible, avoid that kind of uh, solution because it is, it is uh, complex and uh, uh, hard to manage. I think I've, uh, I have another one last slide. Uh, one important aspect in all of this is managing costs. So to quote some, uh, uh, a statistic. I think 40% of people who have recently moved to cloud has indicated cost as the primary driver. 53% uh, of the, the people who have implemented the uh, cloud-based systems are telling that still the cloud is too, uh, the cost is too high. And 80% of the projects have exceeded their, their budget. So managing costs uh, of a cloud implementation is very important. And to do that, you have to have proper a monitoring mechanism. I mean, I think everyone has heard the horror stories where you have uh, uh, provisioned some uh, something on the cloud and forgot about it. And at the end of the month, you have received a massive bill. So to avoid that type of thing, you have to have proper monitoring on your infrastructure so that you are, you are capable of identifying uh, when to provision something and when to uh, 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 end the life cycle of that uh, infrastructure component. And also you can uh, optimize uh, your uh, cost by uh, uh, employing different strategies, like there are reserved uh, resources and on-demand resources. For example, if you if your workloads are continuously running, it's better to take a reserved uh, workload rather than taking on-demand because reserved workloads are cheaper. And, and uh, likewise, there are a whole heap of uh, strategies that you can uh, employ in terms of making sure once you move on to the cloud, that you keep your costs uh, to a minimum. And I think that, that uh, 
uh, finally covers uh, the uh, what what I wanted to uh, do part of my presentation. Hopefully, you have uh, gained some valuable uh, pointers yes, uh, exactly. to use when you uh, go and design your next mm -hmm. basis. True enough, true enough. That was a very insightful session, Prabhat. Thank you so much. So I'm pretty sure the viewers must have got a really good idea of how cloud-based system and solutions should work. Um, so um, I also should uh, mention to you that stay till the end that we have a quiz coming up. Uh, while thanking Prabhat for the insightful session and thanking for uh, letting us do this session on his premises. Um, I think let's we can uh, look into the quiz now. Uh, the question will pop up on the screen and you can drop in your answers. Um, also, don't forget to check out the complete quiz available on the Slascom Academy platform, of which the link is shared in the chat box. Uh, make sure to challenge yourself, answer the quizzes, and um, as we wait for the quiz winner to be displayed, we can take a few questions from the audience. If there are any questions, you can put in, your, put in the chat box at the moment. So uh, till we get a couple of questions, uh, Prabhat, is there? Okay. So I think we have one question. Uh, what are the critical points to consider when designing cloud applications to support high availability? Do you want me to repeat that question again? What are the critical points to consider when designing cloud applications to support high availability? I think that's a very important question. I think we, we covered that uh, aspect in, in uh, some of my uh, slides. Uh, so one important factor is to make sure that if your application is designed in a way that it can sustain failures in, in, in your components or modules. So implementing it in, in kind of a microservices or serverless architecture is uh, very important. Uh, uh, and also to make sure, try and make sure that your applications are stateless. Whenever they fail, you can quickly restart in a, in a new node. So that is, that, is, that is one important factor to consider. And also another important factor is how you manage and store your data. So whenever it comes to uh, uh, selecting storage mechanism, make sure that you select a storage mechanism that is also uh, resilient to failures and also may employ mechanisms to replicate your data across to multiple uh, locations never uh, have a design where you have only one copy of your data in your persistent storage so that those are the the kind of uh, uh, things that you can uh, uh, employ as part of your design to make sure that your application applications can sustain failures in cloud. Got it. And also we have another question, uh, Prabhat. Uh, what is the path you recommend to be a cloud-based system software engineer? Okay, so I think uh, 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 in any case, you have to start off by uh, probably taking a general IT degree so that you uh, get uh, equipped with uh, the general uh, basic uh, knowledge about uh, uh, the, the IT industry, like programming languages and the rest. And after that, I think uh, you, there are different cloud vendors have their own certification. Right. That is a very, very good path for you to uh, uh, get into uh, uh, cloud-based uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, role. Uh, right. For example, I mean, AWS is, is one of one of the one of the, uh, the most popular uh, uh, cloud vendors. They provide. They have a lot of. Uh, Right. courses and online right. uh, uh, exams that you can uh, certify right. yourself with. Right. Uh, similarly, the, the Google Cloud, Azure, they all have their own uh, uh, certification. So what I recommend is you gain a generic uh, general mm -hmm. IT degree and uh, specialize, specialize by uh, taking those uh, window specific right. Right. right, right, wonderful. Thank you. So I think uh, uh, We've got one more question. So yeah. till the uh, technical team puts in the winner for the quiz that's been selected, we'll take this one question. Uh, being university students, what's our role? So I don't know if it's a very more of a general question. Uh, this university student is asking, uh, what's what's our role? Yeah, I, I would uh, answer that in in, a, in an angle I think would be suitable. Mm -hmm. So at the university level i think you, what is important as i said earlier is for you to grasp the the basics mm. uh, uh, of uh, uh, the the industry that is you probably you learn uh, uh, a set of uh, two two programming languages but what is important is to under, understand the the basic underlying principles like object oriented right. programming concepts things mm. like that uh, and also 
I, I'm sure at the university level, uh, there are, uh, uh, as part of the, the, the curriculum, there are uh, segments where you learn mm -hmm. things related to specific mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. cloud technologies or machine learning or things like that. Yeah. Uh, in all those things, what, you, what I think is uh, uh, good for an, uh, from an engineering career perspective is to obtain the, that basic underlying principles yeah. Uh, and also probably as part of your industrial training, mm. gain exposure to industry so that you can uh, realize and figure out how you can apply those uh, uh, knowledge, knowledge into in the industry setting. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insightful session. So um, I hope you uh, we've answered all your questions. Now we are going to be selecting the winner for the quiz for today, the most awaited session. So um, Johan, over to you to select our winner for today. Yes, so we have a winner, uh, Nitarsha. Nitarsha, you are the winner. So um, we are going to be reaching out to you to your email address to send your uh, gift. Uh, thank you for participating on the quiz. At the same time, I have to mention to others, we have, uh, if you didn't win today, don't worry. We have more sessions lined up every month, so you can be a winner. Uh, just participate on our Tech Webinar Series uh, going forward. Um, so um, with that, I would like to say a special thank you to our sponsors, Platinum Sponsors, London, London Stock Exchange and the Vital Hub uh, Innovations Lab, and as well as the gold sponsors, uh, Pearson, RLIT and Accents. Appreciate your support uh, in making this event a reality. The next session, which is very important, uh, is uh, on the Tech Webinar Series will be the introduction to Docker and Kubernetes or uh, DevOps uh, scheduled on the 12th of January. So we hope to see you uh, then with a brand new uh, session in a brand new year. Once again, I would like to thank um, our speaker, Prabhat. Thank you so much, Prabhat, for joining and uh, giving us all the logistical support uh, in conducting this session. And uh, I'm very sure the university students and the IT professionals are grateful for the knowledge that you provided. We hope to see you again in a future session. Thank you so much. Uh, and also thank you everyone uh, for join, uh, who joined us today. Uh, have a pleasant evening and a joyful season ahead. We wish you a very good and prosperous new year. We hope to see you again in January. Thank you.